Good morning. It's uh, November 13th and it's 3.16 a.m. And I can't sleep because of um, some medical problems. And, um, you know, uh, I know part of it's my gallbladder. And I know that, you know, maybe I shouldn't have eaten that piece of fried chicken. And, um, you know, um, I'm just getting over a really, really bad uh, uh, hybrid of uh, the flu virus. And, uh, but uh, nonetheless, I'm overcoming by the mercy and grace of God, I'm overcoming. And uh, other, you know, medical problems that uh, I'm not prepared to go into at this point in time. But uh, that aside, God is good and uh, God has been gracious to me and uh, by the grace of God I live now um, I've been moved to uh, uh, tug on your shirt sleeve about something here I was talking to a friend on Facebook and uh, my friend was relating uh, a lot of personal experiences to me uh, and we were actually touching on the subject of Christianity and um, I, I, I really feel moved uh, to make a presentation about this. We concluded that um, we live in um, treacherous times. And we really do. We, we live in treacherous times. And... Uh, a lot of this uh, had to do with um, the realization that about 90% of people calling themselves Christians are not even followers of Christ. And uh, I had related to my friend that this, this is why I, I think Muslims have such a hard time with uh, people who call themselves Christians. And um, I, you know, I, I have to admit, you know, I am reluctant to call myself a Christian. Not because I don't follow Christ, but because I do follow Christ. Uh, isn't that ironic? Because Christian is a word um, that they a label that they placed upon the followers of Christ at Antioch. That's what they, they called Christians. They called Christians first at Antioch, okay? That's what they called the followers of Christ, Christians, all right? It wasn't a name that the followers of Christ called themselves. We need to be clear on this. <clears throat> does that mean, <coughs> excuse me, but does that mean that, you know, it's, it's, it's a bad thing to be called a Christian? Well, no, not necessarily. But if the world thinks that a Christian is what 90% of people calling themselves Christians is, yeah, that's a bad thing, because 90% of people going around calling themselves Christians are not followers of Christ. And, um, you know, I'm wondering, you know, if that might not also be the case with um, the uh, Muslim faith, you know, that maybe 90% of the people walking around, patting themselves on the back, calling themselves uh, submitters to God, you know, people who actually submit to God and bow down, uh, and, and submit to God are actually not submitters to God, are actually full of pride and arrogance and hatred and, and want to murder people and hurt women. That's no submitter to God, okay? You know, maybe a better word for them would be hypocrite, okay? Like 90% of most Christians, they're not followers of Christ, they're hypocrites. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about my personal conversion experience. Because I'm learning that a lot of these people who think that they have converted to Christ are deluded. They are deluded because they have not yet learned that God is a spirit. And to worship God, you must worship God in spirit and in truth. And that many of these so-called uh, Christians have not yet learned that 
they cannot repent of their own strength. In other words, they cannot save themselves from this untoward generation without God's help. And they think that by merit of their works, their repentance, their version or flavor of repentance, that um, they will be saved and that they are Christians. Well, they're wrong. And um, I will testify that I am saved. I am saved by the blood of Jesus. I really do believe that I am saved. By the grace of God, I'm saved. Not because I'm worthy. Not because I deserve it. No. No. It has nothing to do with those sorts of things. I am saved because I asked for the right gift. I asked for the right thing. I'm saved because I came to my Lord and Savior as a little child in the knowledge that all my guard had to be down before the Almighty One. All of it. All my strongholds, all my pride, every single bit of me had to be down before God. That is complete submission, people. And it is not as easy to attain to as some of you may think. Let me give you some time to think about that while I have a slurp of my wife's coffee. Because what I have to say needs to seriously be considered. My voice is a little hoarse, so, you know, I have to watch it. Um, this uh, flu virus is an incredible thing. Uh, I do thank you all for your prayers, because I think your prayers are helping me. But I have a word from the Lord that I need to share. I need to impart to you. Ninety percent of you people calling yourselves Christians, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you're not saved and you're not really followers of Christ. You may be follower of some denomination or some religion. And you might say, nonsense, I have faith in him. I believe in him. Well, you know, do you believe in him or do you believe in your doctrine? There is true doctrine. I don't knock that. All right? There is uh, pure religion. I don't knock that. I understand that. But except you have the love of Jesus and the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. It has nothing to do with whether or not you still sin. It, you know, a lot of these pastors are talking about, you know, no, no, listen, listen, okay? We don't put the cart before the horse, all right? The horse draws the cart. If you have the Spirit of Christ, you will follow Christ. Now, I want to explain something to you, because I've listened to some of you talk about how, but I have repented, you'll say, and, and, and I have, you know, and he's just not listening. First and foremost, you really must understand that repentance is a gift. It's a gift from God. You can't produce it yourself. It is not in you to produce repentance. You can't do it. It's not it's a it's against human nature, okay? Real godly repentance is against human nature. You cannot produce it. And if you're a woman, how much less you will be able to produce it if you actually have the knowledge that Eve came out of Adam. Adam did not come out of Eve. All right, the foundation, the stuff from whence uh, womanhood was generated, it came out of Adam. So if Adam can't produce it, what makes you think you can? You can't. It's not possible. And there is not a human soul alive on the world today that can produce it of their own uh, uh, volition, of their, their own substance that can make them worthy of the kingdom of God that can make them truly repentant. Repentance is a gift, and you have to pray for it. Okay? That's the first thing. And if you're sincere, God will know. 
God cannot be fooled. God knows the heart. And it is so important for you to understand this when you go, but I cried my face off. I bawled my face off before God and he didn't hear me and I still didn't receive the Holy Spirit. That's because you still weren't sincere. Esau sought repentance with tears and could not find it. Do you understand? God can't be fooled. You can fool yourself. You can fool yourself into thinking you were sincere. But what you need to understand is that through your whole life, from your childhood on up, you have been unconsciously conditioned to believe lies. And unconsciously, your guard is still up. And unconsciously, your mind is still not prepared for the kingdom. Unconsciously, you are not ready to receive the Holy Spirit. So pray daily for that gift, that gift of repentance, godly repentance. Because ungodly repentance won't cut it, okay? I don't care how good a drama queen you are. I don't care how gifted you are at convincing yourself that you really mean it. You won't fool God. You'll fool yourself. You, you'll be convinced you're sincere. But God knows the heart. You see, he knows when your mind and your soul and your spirit are cultivated properly in the word and in the spirit of grace that you might come to the knowledge of the truth. Too many of you out there are patting yourself on the back, calling yourself Christians, followers of Christ. But the Bible says you shall know them by their fruits. I have to tell you something about my own personal experience. For years, I thought I was a Christian. For years, I thought I was a follower of Christ. I did not understand. And many times I would get angry with God and angry with my brother and angry with my sister and angry with myself because I could not understand why things weren't going right and things were not going according to the Word of God, at least the way I understood it at that time. You must pray to God if you really, really, really sincerely want to know God and know Christ. If you really want the love of Jesus, I'm telling you, brother, sister, you must ask God to prepare you. You must ask God to grant you a repentant heart and a repentant spirit, a broken and contrite heart and spirit before God. You can't produce it yourself. Forget it. You'll never do it. God, and only God, can bring you to that point of utter and complete submission to God so that he can come into you and sup with you and you with him. And if you have not had that experience, that infilling of the Holy Spirit, that Ruach, you don't know God. I'm sorry, you know, you may have the best of intentions at heart, but it's still not enough. The heart is not very smart. And don't go with this, well, you know, I trust in my heart because that's the last thing you should be trusting. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I thank God he can know the heart. He can know the heart. And only him can know it in its entirety and fully. Your unconscious mind still has its guard up. And you think you're a Christian. But God knows them that are his. Now, I'm not patting myself on the back, calling myself something. I still don't even think I'm a saint, and I don't even think that God is done with me yet. Yes, I've received the Holy Ghost speak, you know, evidence by speaking in tongues, and I'll tell you something else. If you're laughing at people who speak in tongues, you will pay for that, okay? Because really, you know, um, when you uh, read the story about the upper room, and how all these people mocked at them when they spilled out of that upper room, you know, and they probably did look drunk. They probably did, you know, st stumble. The flesh stumbles before God, okay? They probably were, quote-unquote, drunk on the Holy Spirit. It's a powerful sp spirit, people. It's powerful. It's real. It's God. The flesh can barely stand it. It's so powerful. 
when you receive the real thing, that is. Anyway, I'm going to belabor this a little bit, this whole speaking in tongues thing. I understand there are counterfeit spirits out there. I understand there are pretenders out there. I understand that, okay? But when God comes to visit you, you'll know who it is, okay? You will know it's him. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something else. It's not three people that come to visit you. You know, it's not the Father, and, and, and then there's this other guy called the Holy Spirit, you know, standing there, and then this other guy called uh, uh, the Son standing there, okay? It's not three people. I'm going to tell you something. It is one Spirit, one very, very powerful, loving Spirit. And that Spirit comes into you and sups with you and fulfills you in a way that, it defies any human language. Maybe that's why we speak in tongues, okay? Because um, the utterance, uh, my goodness, you know, when a baby is born, it makes a sound, right? So that everybody knows that that baby has been born. Verily, verily, you must be born again. I'm telling you right now that this experience of speaking in tongues it's real. If it's the real thing, it's real. It's real, people. It's real. And I was one of the greatest doubters ever about this experience. So I, you know, I know from whence I speak. Speaking in tongues, huh, I'm telling you right now, the tongue comes with the shoe. You, <laughs> I can't hardly imagine somebody being filled with that power and majesty from on high and not being able to utter a word or a thing out of his mouth or her mouth. I'm telling you right now, okay, I've had that experience. I fully believe it to be God. And I know that, you know, the deceiver comes and visits me just like he comes and visits every one of us, trying to, you know, put doubt in my mind, trying to deceive me, trying to tell me that I'm a victim of strong delusion and all these other things. But I am telling you right now, I do testify. Christ has come in the flesh, and I'm telling you right now that unless you've had this experience, unless you've actually had the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you don't know him. You don't know him. If you have not had this experience, you do not know him. Okay, you, you might you know, have knowledge of the Lord you know, concerning uh, um, the things that are written in the volume of the book. You may well be operating in a spirit of grace because God is preparing you. But unless you're praying for this gift and unless you are completely sincere toward God, and remember, you can never attain to it without God's intervention, you don't know him. Not in the biblical sense of that word, no, to know, to become one with, to unite with. It's heavy on my heart to give you this testimony because I just see so many people fooling themselves these days. But unless you really do have the love of Jesus, unless you really do have the love of Christ, you know, I'm saying this in the English language because I'm talking to people who think and talk English, all right? That is probably as far as, uh, you know, my uh, ministry would reach to English-speaking peoples. I can only say that if you haven't had this experience, this power from on high, if you have not been endowed with this power from on high, you, you likely don't know the Lord, okay? You may have intellectual knowledge of the Lord, okay? You may have other sorts of spiritual knowledge you need to understand that the gifts plural these are spiritual gifts all right these spiritual gifts and the calling are without repentance that means you are formed in your mother's womb with these spiritual gifts and you are being called from your mother's womb to come to god to submit to repent
That doesn't make you saved, brother. That doesn't make you saved, sister. Okay? You need that infilling. You need that experience. Verily, verily, you must be born again. You're not going to get it practicing ritualism, you know, and, and communion in churches and getting uh, your, your uh, uh, Catholic doctrines or, or what we used to call, um, uh, uh, um, uh, what, what did we call it again? I can't believe I, you know, I, I don't remember it anymore because it's been so long. You know, I went through those rituals. They're dead. They're dead rituals, people. They will not save you. Catechism. That's what it's called. Catechism. I went through three years of catechism. It won't save you. Catechism can't save you. Okay, it's just a bunch of dead doctrine. Get away from it. Turn your hearts to God. Be sincere. Pray. Sincerely, as sincerely as you can before God, because God is just, all right? He knows you can't produce the level of sincerity that is needed for you to get saved. You can't produce it, all right? As soon as you can come to terms with that fact, that you don't have what it takes, that you need God to help you, to make intercession for you in prayer, the, sooner, uh, the better off you'll be, you know, the sooner you come to this knowledge, that you can't do it, the better off you'll be. There are people, I'm telling you, they are so wicked at heart, they have no idea how wicked they are. There's people with their minds and their soul and their spirits so uh, uh, baked, so so uh, burnt, their consciences are seared, okay? They will never see the kingdom of God because of this, all right? That They will never enter in because of this. You don't know what it means to enter in. Okay, this is the thing. Unless you've experienced what I've experienced, you don't know what it means to enter in. Anyway, they will never see the kingdom of God. You know, and unless something happens to them by the grace of God, some tragedy or something where they realize, man, this is just not enough. And they realize, you know, you know, I want my life to have meaning. I want my life to have purpose. I don't want to live in vain. They will never, they will never even think to ask for God's intervention in their life. And that's only the first step. That doesn't mean you've arrived just because you fall on your knees and you ask God to intervene in your life. You've got to mean it, and not just a little. You've got to mean it so much that you are prepared to lay down every single thing about you, and you have to be prepared to let go of everything. Do you know what I was prepared to let go of so that I would know God? You see, I remember. I remember the tempter right there whispering in my right ear, you do this and you're going to lose your family, Edward. That's what he told me. You do this and you will lose your family. Guess what? I lost my family. The, the, the tempter didn't lie to me, even though he is a liar and a deceiver and a whisperer and a backbiter. No, he went to work on my family because he was wroth with me. He wanted to make me pay because I thought, you know, I owe my family the truth. If I really love my son, if I really love my daughter, if I really love my wife, if I really love my children, I would press on because what good can I be to my family if all I have are lies to give them? If all I can offer them is a lie? And so I pressed on and I prayed that God changed my heart, conditioned my heart, my soul and my spirit, that I might enter into the kingdom of God, that I might know the truth. And the Lord smiled on me. Praise God. He smiled on me. Praise God. And I remember it. I remember it. I remember it. I felt his smile like a warm smile a mile long. I felt it. But, okay, people go, oh, that's sensual. Well, I'm telling you something. In the spirit, you can feel a lot of things, and it ain't just sensual. 
I felt the power of the Almighty God. And you know, if, if you think that God didn't give you sense for a reason, you're senseless yourself. God gives us senses for a reason. No, what I'm talking about isn't uh, sensual after the flesh. You probably can't even feel God's smile in the spirit, most of you. You probably can't even feel God embrace you in the spirit, most of you. You know, every once in a while, I'll be walking down the road, and my Lord will give me a, a I'll feel his hand upon me. I'll feel it upon me. Okay, and I will feel his smile, and I'll know my Lord is pleased with me. Do you know that I pray that I do the things that are pleasing in the sight of God? And God knows the heart. You see, this is what's so important to understand, is that God knows your heart better than you do. You can fool yourself, but you can't fool God. You can convince yourself that you're sincere. But you'll never convince God unless you really are. Because then God isn't just convinced, God knows. See, you can't persuade God anything. All right? He's God. He knows the truth. You can't fool Him. You can't pull the wool over His eyes. But some of you don't understand that you have unconscious strongholds. Strongholds you are not even aware of working in your unconscious mind. You know, these Satanists, the reason they attack these children and do all these horrible rites on them is so that they totally fracture and shatter their unconscious minds so that that soul can't be saved. Well, it can. not It's amazing what God is able to do, how God is able to repair how he is able to heal. But odds are, when that person grows up, they're never going to make that appeal to God. But God is just. You know, unless there's been some real intervention in their life, they'll probably never make that appeal to God. You have to appeal to God, okay? You know, when the, the lawyer appeals to the judge, you have to make an appeal to God. And you have to be prepared to lay down all your defenses and all, everything. I mean everything. I had to be willing to sacrifice my family. But I reasoned that if I was a real, true family man who really, truly loved his children and uh, was dedicated to their spiritual welfare, I would press on anyway in prayer. And there's a saying uh, among those who actually know Christ, uh, it's called breaking through in prayer. Because you can press on and press on and press on, and finally you make a breakthrough. You break through. Because the bonds of the enemy can only hang on for so long. Okay, the enemy is not omnipotent but God is and you can weaken the enemy until the, the 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 devil's claws that are stuck in your unconscious mind that are you know grappling your unconscious mind let go they can't hang on to you anymore they have to let go I just want to say this before I close Jesus loves you he wants to see you saved. But pray for the gift of repentance. Pray for it. It's a gift. Okay? You can't produce repentance yourself. You need God's intercession. Because I would say well over 90% of people thumping themselves on the chest these days, walking around calling themselves Christians, putting down Jews and Muslims and everybody else, thinking they're so high and mighty, they're not going to see the kingdom of God. Because they do not have the love of Christ. They just don't have it, friend. Okay? I hope that some of you benefit from this. I really hope that your hearts become sincere toward God. Because by the mercy and grace of God, I'm going to see the kingdom. 
I hope I see you there too. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening to me. Um, I'm telling you, I'm declaring to you the full Bible truth. God bless you. God bless you.